we're going to get started day two. Day one was uh, successful and had some fantastic talks. And today looks great as well. So I'm just going to introduce our moderator here, uh, Ambassador Henry O'Donnell. He's going to moderate this first panel this morning on uh, persecuted displaced youth and displaced persons in refugee camps. I'm going to stop talking and over to you, Ambassador O'Donnell. Thank you very much. Thanks to you here in the audience and those of you who are dialing in online. It's a pleasure to have you here as part of this panel. Uh, I am the moderator. I'm a retired U.S. diplomat, foreign service officer, now a professor at Arizona State University in the Arizona State University Lab for uh, Leadership, uh, Diplomacy, and National Security, and in Washington, D.C. at the ASU campus. I have speakers here today on this panel who you will hear from who are courageous in their communities. They are character-driven leaders by the definition that they serve a cause greater than self and risk to themselves. So you will hear their stories. This is about storytelling, and it's about persecuted and displaced youth, displaced persons, especially in refugee camps or refugee situations in the diaspora outside of their home. We want to focus this aspect of Genocide Awareness Week on what the results are of genocide, hatred, bigotry, wherever it is in the world. And that's the product of the, the, the refugees that we see worldwide. And now uh, over 100 million people, which I'll talk about in just a minute. So I will introduce the speaker in, in just a moment, but uh, the these are the panelists who uh, are with us today. Uh, Zah, who you'll hear from first, from uh, Myanmar, Burma, who is a teacher and mentor of young people in the Kachin minority community. Uh, then you'll hear from Mohammed al Tarane from Jordan, who works with Syrian refugee children and in Jordan and other refugee uh, families and children in Jordan and throughout the Middle East, really. You will hear from him. Then Mina Mushtaq, who is a student here at Arizona State University, and she represents the 70 ASU <laughs> Afghan women students who came after the fall of, of Kabul, and they're here studying and looking for the future, and Mina will, will talk. And then also Arifa, who was a member of the Afghan Army, first lieutenant who worked with U.S. soldiers, special forces, the Afghan Army uh, in combat, and is now here in and she and her colleagues in what was called the female tactical students are many of them are here in the United States and safe in different parts of the United States. So 100 million refugees worldwide. This is an incredible number of people, meaning people who have families who are outside of their home. They can be displaced internally within, uh, for example, Miramar, the Kachin people that are still there and in a protected area, or it can be Afghans in Pakistan or other countries, Turkey, or around the world. But this is a, a bit overwhelming now that it's grown so fast. And this was the the, uh, the Ukrainian refugees, certainly, but there, there are millions of refugees in, in different areas which you're going to hear about today. These are some of the world leaders that are active in, in helping refugees and and reaching out to them and helping them wherever they are. Filippo Grande, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, and you know the UNHCR and, and their programs. Uh, on the right, Jan Eglin, I put him there from Norway. He represents many European countries that have organizations like this. The Norwegians are especially active in many areas around the world. And then you all know Cindy McCain uh, of, of Arizona and is now becoming the executive director, just took the position of the UN Food, Food Program, which is extremely important. They, they won the Nobel Peace Prize a few years ago with David Beasley in charge of everything they've done in Afghanistan and countries around the world. And David Milligrand of the International Rescue Committee, who you know, and the International Rescue Committee is active here. They're active in Afghanistan. David Milligrand, a former UK minister. And then uh, Assistant Secretary Julieta Bowles-Noyce. She will be speaking at five o'clock uh, on Thursday. And I hope you all will be there in Marabella. 
and she represents the U.S. State Department as an ambassador in the Bureau of Population, Refugees, and Migration. She'll talk about programs of the U.S. government, and she'll, she'll also be preceded by Matthias Mittman, another senior foreign service officer at 3.30 in Maribella. He was the consul general in his ordeal uh, during and after the Azidi genocide. So they'll bring the perspective of the U.S. government to this discussion today and, and on Thursday. So I'm going to introduce and let uh, Zah and Mohammed and, and Mina and, and Arifa, Arifa talk about their stories. But I want to ask you all, what about youth living in refugee camps and, and in diaspora and the refugee families? I mean, we, we know, what can we do? Uh, I think my students at ASU who care about human rights and the rights of women and girls and, and displaced persons and preventing genocide, hatred, bigotry, whether it's ethnic cleansing or, or uh, persecution or it results in, in eventually genocide, what can they do? Well, hope and also remember. And so uh, this session is about telling these stories so hopefully they will see in those young people in Myanmar and Afghanistan or where they are, that they're not forgotten. Uh, and what, so that's the bottom line for me, to give them hope. And I think you'll hear stories of, of things that these panelists have done and thought about, and we can discuss that as well. Uh, and we will have a question and answer session at the end of the presentation, but I'd like to let all of them make a presentation and then we'll open it up for questions. But I think uh, in terms of living, uh, certainly David Milligrand and UNHCR and the US government and the Norwegian government and other funders, uh, it's basic human needs. Uh, individuals want to live in peace. They want to uh, educate their children. They want to have clean water. They want to have food security. They want to have shelter. It's basic human needs of what we're trying to, to help achieve in these, in these situations where there are 100 million people suffering today. And especially the young people, many of whom have grown up, uh, born and raised in no other life than being in a refugee camp. So let's think about that. There are concrete actions we can take from here in Phoenix uh, and, and in Tempe and all over the United States. There are things we can do to give them hope for, for the basic human needs, for education, and to know that they're not forgotten and that there's a memory of what's going on in terms of their tragedy that they're living every day. So with that, let me uh, let me go to our first speaker. Uh, Za is uh, an incredible person, a, a courageous, character-driven leader uh, from the Kachin community, the Christian minority in Burma. You know about the Rohingyas, but there are other minorities that the military government, who just control the military junta, persecute. And so these are the young people that Zao works with, and this was a photo which, again, New Zealand is funding, a, a labor union in New Zealand is funding a program for musical instruments. So I thought that was a, a powerful statement of something can be done that means, means uh, something to Zao and the young people he's mentoring. So Zao, over to you. Please join me here and uh, tell your story. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, and uh, let me begin my talk by saying a very, very special thanks to respect and Ms. Uh, Odona also wishes uh, Ashley and everyone uh, for this, giving me this rare opportunity to share the suffering of Myanmar, uh, particularly <clears throat> my people of uh, <clears throat> I'm also very humbled and honored to be sharing the same thing with uh, 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 our ASU lab body, and also this amazing two speaker from Afghanistan. I'm Sao Du Kong, and I'm the founder of the To the Arts of Academy Art Program for Internet Displaced Person and Children from Myanmar. Uh, Myanmar, or formerly known as Burma, stands exactly between the world's largest democratic nation called India and also a communist country, China. We are also part of 11 uh, ASEAN countries, which is in South Asia. Here's a brief background of Myanmar. Myanmar is well known for its uh, political history. 
So we were under six decade long full military control, but slowly opened up to quasi democratic regime, but tragically fall back into the ruthless military regime last two years ago. Uh, we are also in the middle of uh, the world's second largest or uh, the world's second longest civil war between the armed, ethnic armed groups and also military. And we got very infamous uh, case of ethnic Rohingya uh, cleansing, which is highly condemned by the whole world. So in uh, 2021, February 1st, the military decided, uh, the military took Myanmar over in a coup. So despite conducting a peaceful protest, civilian among, uh, including uh, women, children, and young people were all shot down like animals uh, on the street in a broad daylight and probably on every corner of the country. So internet and news media organizations are heavily monitored by the uh, ruthless military and we are cut off from the war and once again, we are far back into isolation. So this, this is the, this figure show the number of uh, last year, uh, aftermath of the coup, and the actual numbers are higher than this figure. So, uh, as a Kachin who belongs to the minority group and also took part in uh, anti coup activities, he has been a uh, security concern for me. So, I had to flee to the rocky hill of the Liza, which is close to China. And Liza is a place where the Qing Independent Army KIA has been residing and uh, fighting for. Uh, for our Kachin people for freedom, justice, and self-determination for seven decades. Amid the crisis that national unity of government uh, was created in opposition to the military regime, and many of the executive leaders also fled to Liza for refuge. So Liza is also a place where it is fully surrounded by a camp for internally displaced uh, persons. And they are also facing a quarter of the humanitarian crisis, such as uh, the fall of a coup, uh, the global uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, COVID-19, and also natural disaster, and shortage of essentials such as water, food, and clothing. So children in these cases have experienced and saw many of the atro atrocity and the humanity. So as helpless as they are, they are only to feel the emotions and those emotions are needed to be expressed in a certain way. So what I learned from, what I learned was that the best way to uh, express the, the children's suffering is through art. So that's where the role of uh, art came into play to act as a language of love and emotion and to voice their suffering. Uh, the Mrs. Michelle, the Asian, uh, actress has ever won the Oscar this year. She wants that uh, the language of love and emotion can cross all the boundaries. So I'd like to tell you a few stories from my uh, art student from my program. This is uh, Zhao Sheng. Uh, he told me that he was always on the run because the military uh, is always attacked then. And he shared me that <clears throat> He was always crying all day and night alone because he was starving and always in state of fear for survival. And he's kind of lived in the Jian IDD camp, which is close to Liza as well. And his parents and child village were burned down by the military group, Bessie. <clears throat> and family were desperate and up until still, they are, couldn't be able to find shelter over their head. And this is. <clears throat> and uh, as a girl, since she was very young, she saw the humanity against her people. She said her uh, mother, sister, and her friends were being sold into slavery through human trafficking, and she depicted in her painting. And this is the Dabu. And I vividly remember the analogy that she used. She said, the life of IDD are like uh, blinded persons who are Bonded by change and force them to walk aggressively like slaves. And she said, the Burbage military killed all the villagers and raped their women. <clears throat> and this is uh, Kong Lu. And from, from what I know, he has been at the orphanage since he was a baby. As you see in his painting, the atrocity that against our people are merciless and barbaric. And she said, or he said, it's 
are the percent pregnant women who are haunted by gunfire, bloodshed, and, and, and he painted in his, um, he expressed his feeling in his painting. So these are just a few stories that I mentioned, but we must remember that there are many stories out there that are un un untold. So over 100 IDB Kachin students has joined my program, what I call Through the Eyes of Academy Art Program. This very art program exists in order to amplify the suffering and injustice and also to cultivate a culture of faith, hope, and love. Hearing all those stories, the struggle story. I always felt a sense of guilt because there's much more needs to be done. And also I felt there's, there seems to be no justice for them to suffering like this for seven decades long. So this I did live up on the mountain. So we have a daily routine of bringing food then. And here I am on a bike, uh, bringing some food and snack to my art picture student. So this is how they eat, uh, just sticky rice and I uh, boy egg, and see we don't have enough food and enough place, we just use banana leaf instead. Uh, so they, we don't have enough food, so they eat only uh, breakfast and dinner, just to have energy to survive. So the more uh, the struggles and uncertainties are not strangers for our rich and young people. But the more I spend time with them, the more I learn about the uh, pure heart and empathy toward others. A profound example would be when Ukraine, Russia, what happened? And this, our stirring Christian student who have got so much anger and driven with emotion. And then just the thought that people like them are suffering similar situation, but in another country. So to stand up against this, we pay ourselves and we show our solidarity with the Ukrainian people. And it turned out that we were the very first group that showed in solidarity with the people of Ukraine from Myanmar. I was so touched and I even cried. And I didn't, I didn't organize this uh, workshop. They just out of their love, compassion, and anger for oppression. So I really touched and I shared this uh, empathetic action of my Kachin Ukrainian. I also saw my international friends from the McKay Institute and also Mrs. Asin as well. So this really paved an idea for me and Mrs. Asin to exchange a letter between our Kachin R student and AH student and also uh, high school student from Virginia, where Mrs. Uh, Ashley Jonas attend. So uh, Ms. Ashley and I genuinely believe that this letter exchange will serve uh, as a bridge to dive into each other world and possibly open a door to fruitful relationship between uh, American and Arabian student. So to this letter exchange program, once you receive the letter, <laughs> our bitches would have felt that. They are not alone, as I mentioned. They are not forgotten. <coughs> and because that is the sense of all the students and colleagues that are standing our continue. Okay. So, uh, uh, no, recovery is a little bit. Uh, I, I want to say, if you could read these letters, you'd know why he's important. The letters between American high school and college students to the Kachin young people uh, expressing who they are, their lifestyle. The Kachin people, uh, young people, high school students getting these letters from, from uh, boys and girls all in Virginia and here at ASU. And, and uh, understanding somebody care. That's grassroots care and love that, that you can't replicate between governments and so on. This is the kind of program, the letter exchange, that I think could be replicated in other situations with refugee children and other areas between 
students here in high schools in Arizona or in other college regions around the United States or Arizona. Thank you so much. So as I am, as I'm standing on the American soil, I would like to tell you the warm and genuine relationship between our Asian people and the Americans that can be traced back all the way back to 1942. During the war, to the American government conducted many of military operations across India, China, and Myanmar to fight against the fascist Japanese imperials. So many Asian. Voluntarily joined the American government of military operation called 101 Detachment, which is also known as USA Kachin Rangers. So, we, the Kachin USA Rangers, were the most successful military veteran across uh, American uh, history of, uh, of military operation. That's why, we, even we were, the USA Kachin were uh, awarded presidential distinguished unit citation and even. Uh, Two stages were built to honor them inside of the U.S. Uh, embassy in Myanmar. Also, the replica were built in the inside of the, yeah, the compound Virginia as well. Even uh, Mitch uh, McConnell once mentioned that Kachim people deserve particular mention for the commitment, sacrifice, and invaluable support. So I'm wearing uh, today a Kachim traditional towel for men like this. So the Kachim. Soldiers and American soldiers were celebrating together at the end of the uh, World War II. Even our Kachin language was right, invented by the uh, Swedish American missionary. His name is called uh, Ola Hansen. So, as I'm standing in, fr in front of you, I'm reminded of the bound between the Kachin and Ameri American. We are not strangers, but comrades who once fought side by side against the fascist Japanese imperial yeah. since World War II with unbreakable strengths and yielding courage and unwavering determination. Two friends are those who stand by each other, especially in times of trouble. And for us, for the Kachin people, the fight for justice, freedom, and self-determination is far from over. And for many of you in the West may think that the book on World War II has been closed, but for us, the struggle continues. So we have been severely oppressed by the military for seven decades old, and we cannot do it alone. We need your help. Whenever I think of the military general, whenever I think of the faces of military general that has caused so much bloodshed to our people, I see only in cruelty and injustice. But when I look at our Christian young people, I see hope, love, and compassion. They are courage in the face of adversity is truly a testament to the resilience of our people. So I'd like to conclude with this video where our vision to then to amplify the empathy and voices of our oppressed people against injustice and suffering. Thank you all so much. Ukraine, Ukraine, Thank you very much. That was so powerful and meaningful, and it's expressed to your students and families. We care, and we have not forgotten. Ahmed al the founder of Blue Umbrella Group, Jordan citizen, a lawyer, international lawyer, human rights activist, and, uh, and, and intellectual too. I found out in learning about Middle East and uh, Mohammed's story, and he comes from a family of 
lawyers and and uh, doctors and, and uh, his grandfather helped write the Constitution of Georgia. So he got a unique perspective, not only as a, a legal scholar and international activist, but also in terms of what he does for young people in refugee camps and communities, Jordan and around the Middle East. Specifically, I first learned about what he was doing to Syrian young people from the tragic Syrian civil war that are now in Jordan and, and uh, growing up there in school. So, uh, Mohammed, please share your story. Thank you so much. Mr. Ambassador, and uh, I don't know if I'm lucky after coming up to this powerful presentation from my uh, colleagues. Uh, so, uh, 10 years ago, I was uh, working with the local young youth of South Jordan. We were discussing about how we can convince uh, the community leader in that uh, in the village uh, to allow the girl going to school and also how we can convince them to allow the women to work in the small factories that we built in, uh, in that area. But during that very strong discussion, my phone was ringing, and uh, I got, um, it's the first time in my life that an international phone number appeared in my mobile. And uh, I sit in with a bunch of the people and say like, plus one, which country? We don't know. So I pick up the phone and say, Salam Alaikum. The guy said, um, this is Muhammad al -Tawani. And I said, yes. And he said, this is a guy who came in the for international leadership. Um, and uh, I say, uh-huh. <laughs> and, uh, and he continued continue by saying, uh, you get nominated for uh, the leadership program at the Mekin Institute. And I said, still in silence, that he goes, uh, we please to let you know that you get nominated for the program. Uh, and I say, okay. And he just, I think he realized at that point that I don't speak English at all. And yes, and okay, it's maximum knowledge of the English language. So he goes, Is your email lawyer? And I said, Yes. And he said, Okay, I sent an email to you. You need to fill the application before the end of this month. So, um, and I will resend it again to you. So please fill that application and send it back to me. You know, I said my only word. Okay. <laughs> and he thanked the phone, you know. So I looked to my, so all the, you know, all my team is says, hey man, you speak English. And I said, I don't know, someone called me, say something about my email. So uh, maybe it's if he's on a hacker and he wanna hack my email. Mm -hmm. So my colleagues is like, what on earth that you have information that someone would spend a dollar to get it. So let's, let's back to a man and find out. It, turned out, it turns out that um, I get nominated by a joint program between ASU and McCain Institute, whereas my, I meet my, my colleagues with that. And uh, the, the idea of that program, of the goal of that program is that to collect uh, young leaders from all around the world to attend a one year program on at McCain Institute to learn about leadership and design what they call the leadership action. And um, uh, I, Mr., uh, I attend the program and Basil Holt and General Fracker was, you know, um, uh, was teaching us about uh, how we can explore ourselves and how we can enhance our leadership skills as well as build a leadership action. Ladies and gentlemen, I come from Jordan, uh, a country that's open border for millions of refugees uh, from all around the world, from Palestine, Syria, Iraq, Libya, and the list goes on. And uh, when I'm planning of my leadership action plan at the NGO program, I was thinking about all the problems, the obstacles, and challenges that face my friends who live in a refugee camp. And um, I always, I will, I always uh, say that it's not our fault that we're born in the Middle East. That, uh, you know, <laughs> we must do something about it. We will, we will create a, a better future together. Uh, despite the difference 
uh, I believe uh, we will find a common ground where we can build uh, we can we can build something that will be an umbrella that unified us. Um, so in order to do this pitching, uh, I established a nonprofit organization it's called the Blue Umbrella. And uh, the main goal of uh, the organization is to enable young leaders to build sustainable civil society. Uh, so we try to create safe space for young leaders to, to interact with each other and also enable them to create their own solution for their own problems. Um, this is kind of the, 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 um, the, the way how we run the, the program. So we, um, in, you know, especially refugees uh, and the young, uh, young uh, leaders who live inside the camp, uh, some of them born and raised inside the refugee. So uh, the need and the challenges and the solution and they visually in a way it's different about how we look. So each program we develop uh, inside the umbrella, it, it had their own story. It's um, it's really um, it's really hard to tell all the stories, but um, one like for example one of uh, of the story with with uh, with Ima the girl in the middle that's holding the baby. I remember one day. Uh, we were inside the Zatri camp. It's one of the largest camp for Syrian refugees in Jordan. And I was doing a training for young leaders inside the camps. And um, and uh, and all the time when I'm doing the training, I saw this young uh, girl sitting uh, away from the training uh, place. And uh, I was feeling that she has something to say, right? So sometimes you see someone staring to you, you feel like, like okay, there's something you want to say, right? So I approached her, and uh, I was, uh, and uh, you know, um, she was uh, holding a baby. Uh, I said to her, "Why you wouldn't join us?" And uh, she said, uh, "What do you think? What, what do you do with this young, uh, young uh, group? It's not my business." I, I said, um, "I said, like, what's your name?" The man, she said. Uh, I asked her, "How old are you?" I said, "15 years old." And I'm trying to uh, to, to know to break the ice between us in the conversation. I, I said, What's a beautiful baby? Uh, she's your sister. And uh, and the shock was when she told me no. Uh, she's my daughter. So I looked at her and uh, you know, what your daughter? Uh, how old is she? And she said, two years and a half. I was really, I feel uh, I heard the sadness in her voice when she said that. Uh, and as anyone, my natural, uh, my natural reaction was, how come? And she said, simply, I got, uh, I got married when I was 12, get pregnant, and when I was 13, and now I'm 15 years old having this baby. Uh, but if you want to be uh, shocked, uh, just to know that uh, I'm divorced now, and uh, I need to take care of myself, and her. Um, I can't believe what, 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 what she said to me, to be honest. It, it wasn't, that wasn't the, uh, my expectations conversation. Uh, since that conversation, I worked with Ima to uh, develop a project that's called Anna Kowea, that's when I'm strong. And uh, so what, uh, what we do in this project is that we design a special education program for them. But also in other activity, we do a social uh, social cycle support to them. And also we do a campaign that raise, raise awareness inside the camps about the negative effect of the early marriage. That's, um, that's, uh, that's how we work. That's how we design the program. And now after six years from this conversation, Iman become a project officer with these outside the camps. Um, have a better life for herself and her daughter. I also have a mission to help all young girls being in her situation as well. Um, Iman's story, one of the millions of the stories that you can hear inside the camps. And um, uh, the I'm, I'm talking and speaking about this 
generation who um, find themselves in, in the middle of the world that uh, they don't know uh, when it will end and even why it starts. You know, it, the need of this young generation goes for all area of the Italian and developing area, such as, you know, education, health, food, shelter, etc. So um, today I'm, I'm really glad to have this opportunity to talk about this event, this event to highlight about the problem facing uh, displaced youth, refugee uh, Refugee youth, you know, if you look for them, the things that they want is the same with the young people everywhere. Uh, they want to be a consultant and to listen to uh, They want to be engaged uh, to contribute uh, to a part of be a part of the solution. They want opportunities, education, employment, and inclusion. Uh, youth who are living inside um, the camps are exposed to unique distresses, such as living in the war zone, high, high, higher level of um, physical and sexual violence, and minimum access to shelter, food, and education. From my own experience, refugee youths who decide it would rather work than it depends on the Nigerian. Um, and, and they always express frustration at the limited employment and life with opportunities that are available. These express concern uh, about safety, security, and freedom of movement, uh, and their difficulty of obtaining uh, documents. And this is really an issue for, for all the refugee youth. Uh, in some location in the Middle East, uh, they also highlight the police harassment as well as arrest. Uh, arrest. So, and all of those other young refugees uh, have highlighted challenges uh, related to the lack of relevant, honesty, transparent information about the asylum process, refugee rights. Uh, available services to them that is open to them from accreditation organization or INGO also and, uh, and and even they have a problem to know information about the society of the culture that they are the culture of asylum. So um, um, that the United Nations uh, Children Party the uh, UNICEF uh, they estimate a record of thirty seven million children displaced from their home by the end of 2021. And uh, this is the highest, just to know, this is the highest number after the Second World War. So, um, so um, that's, that's, that's number need to be locked and we need to look at that number and try to find solutions because if you if if you look about what's happened in ISIS, the way how they recruit people in the Middle East fighting against the other countries, they recruit in this because what I mentioned in the beginning of my um, my speech that some of them they born a race inside the camp. So the, um, now uh, back in 2010, the person born now is a teenager. And they spend the whole life inside the camps. So it's very easy to recruit them, to make the hate speech and recruit them in this way. So uh, I will uh, I will end up by, by saying I will, uh, I'm really grateful for SU and the ambassador to, for giving me this opportunity to, uh, to be the voice of this young refugees. Uh, I wish that in all international forums that uh, we will our voice be as here uh, at the genocide world. Uh, thank you for listening, and I'm looking forward to your question. Thank you. thank you very much, Mohammed. 
I met Mohammed and Zod when they were first in the United States, I think in 2016 or 2014. 14. And they both spent a year here in the United States. Uh, uh, Mohammed was in Minnesota, Zod was in Los Angeles. And they went back home and they implemented everything they learned from uh, being that experience. So it was given to them in that Next Generation Leaders Program. And they've continued to, to pay back to their community and pay forward. And I know Mohammed, you and Zah are going to continue to sure. do great things. And we just want to keep in touch with you and see what things you're going to achieve. So thank you, Mohammed. Okay. Thank you, Zah. Appreciate it. Now I'd like to introduce the first of our two representatives of Afghanistan and uh, who will speak. And both of these ladies are now here in Phoenix and they're safe but they both have stories to tell that I want to share with you. Mina Mushtaq is a young woman from uh, Afghanistan, a, a part of the, the Adara community, and she uh, was a in a group of students uh, from Afghanistan selected by the U.S. government to go to the Asian Women's University in Chigong, Bangladesh. So she was studying, I think, in her third year, uh, a junior at that, uh, at that university, and the reason for that program was that uh, she and, and all of her, her colleagues at, at that program would return to Afghanistan, be members of the Afghanistan government, NGOs, and be active in society. Well, I worked with these uh, women when I was in Afghanistan in 2011 to 2014. And we had every year 10 or 12 uh, of these young women who would come intern in the ministry where I worked, the Ministry of Counter Fives. Very bright, uh, very dedicated to a different Afghanistan, fighting corruption, making Afghanistan a, a country that, that they could be proud of in their generation. So Mina uh, and her colleagues now, sadly, because of everything that's happened in Afghanistan and the fall of Kabul, 70 of them are here at Arizona State University as students. And Mina is one of those pursuing their degree. They have hopes for the future and planning their lives, but they also have family still in Afghanistan. The Hazara community persecuted minority in Afghanistan. They worry about their families there in the Taliban rule. They're worried about their families in, in refugee situations, either in Turkey or in Pakistan or wherever they are. So Mina, thank you for being with us and thanks for all you're doing. And you are a character-driven leader and a very brave woman. So. Should please share your story with us. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Mina and Ambassador of General Arnold uh, is a bit about our background of being a group of uh, students of Canada. And Kimi Green, uh, we don't remember, was um, September, that uh, second September, that uh, from after a long that we had through Riyadh and um, in Spain and from starting from Kabul to Riyadh and from there to Spain and eventually we came here um, in uh, the United States and were um, about a while in um, Wisconsin in Fort McCoy camp and um, thankfully ASU gave us an opportunity of um, hosting us here as a student and giving a life opportunity for us to complete our um, educational degrees and um, pursue our dreams. Um, as uh, we, uh, as Ambassador Janelle said, we were part of um, as students who were studying um, in Asian University for Women in Bangladesh and were supposed to become the leaders and the uh, builders of Afghanistan, a new um, country with democratic um, values. 
um, and a country that is um, that the next generation gonna be proud of um, of their country. Uh, unfortunately, things happen differently, and um, we we're not able to stay there anymore and um, and study. Um, if we were there, of course, we would um, fight against the Taliban in any terms that we could, if starting from peaceful protests and rallies and gatherings um, and speaking against them and organizing um, educational centers for our um, young uh, girls and uh, women. And any form of uh, resilience and um, uh, uh, types of protests or anything that we could, we obviously would do. But uh, the situation turns differently, and we were uh, we wanted to um, go to back to Bangladesh and continue our study after the COVID pandemic. Um, we're in control uh, in Bangladesh and specifically in our um, university, and that was the plan that we have to go there. And um, it turns out that we could then, and within uh, two months, we were applying for visa. We were um, going from our hometown to uh, the capital city and uh, from one place to another place and um, eventually ended up um, in the month of August. And it was the time that um, everything was kind of shut down. Um, we, everybody kind of felt um, that um, there a, a, a greater events gonna happen. and. Um, not everything going to be in control of people, and um, there was not much flight. So when the 15th of August, the fall of Kabul happened, and uh, we uh, we lost our hope that we cannot go back and continue our study. Most of us were seniors and juniors, and um, a few of us um, just applied for university, and we were hopeful, and uh, as, as other um, young uh, people around the world were excited about their excited about their first day of school. Uh, there were many of us um, who were too excited for that, but um, uh, our dreams were shattered um, by that event, unfortunately. And thankfully, we uh, we didn't know that we we're gonna go to ES. Ended up to ES, honestly, and uh, we found it out when we reached out uh, Riyadh. And then they said, "You're not gonna go to um, Bangladesh." You're gonna go to US, and there you're gonna continue your studies. Um, that was a, 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 a speaking of our emotion at that time. Uh, it wasn't something. Even I, when I think as right now, what was I was thinking about um, at that time? I cannot remember it fully because uh, I was worried about my family. I was so angry um, about uh, for the authority of my country. Uh, and at the same time, I, I, I didn't know where I'm, I'm, I'm going to go and where I'm going to end up. So it was a very mixed emotion at that time. We were so frustrated, frustrated. we were so emotional and, and kind of depressed. Um, we didn't know uh, what we're going to do, but we were so hopeful that if any chance that's going to be given to us, we're going to use it fully, rightfully, and in, in, a, uh, in a good um, uh, matter. Um, so when we, uh, jumping from one event to another event, when we reached um, to United <coughs> States and we were in the Fort McCoy camp, uh, we realized that uh, in the camp, uh, there is no educational center for the children and um, most of the children are uh, wasting their time and uh, as kids do or fighting and going there and causing troubles. Uh, so we organized a school for our children in the Fort McCoy camp. And as a young, um, prosperous and, and kind of um, people who wants to, to establish something back in our country and here we are seeing our um, own people and we wanted to do something for them. So starting from there, we started having um, educational center for children. And when we uh, were giving the opportunity for coming to ASU, um, so we came here and we organized as um, Afghan uh, Student Association. And within that, uh, we organized our first uh, Nowruz celebration, our first uh, uh, information session about Afghanistan and any uh, cultural events or any kind of informational informational events for Afghanistan. And um, it started from there and we were, we're not silenced about what happened in Afghanistan and 
um, what happened um, for our um, women in Afghanistan in particularly. But in, uh, in September of 2022, um, an um, attack happened in Kabul and particularly in Dashti Parchi in the west side of Kabul. And um, that attack happened in an educational center, um, which was predominantly um, that area is uh, Hazara people are uh, living there. And that was not a, the first attack, uh, unfortunately, on our own educational centers on the west side of the Kabul that are predominantly dominated by the Hazara community. Um, that uh, became a moment for us to go back to the sad reality that most of us are belonging to a community um, called Hazara. Hazara community is an ethnic group native to Afghanistan and uh, predominantly are Shia Muslim. Um, and they have faced a long history of persecution, discrimination, including series of massacre, genocidal acts. And um, while there have been multiple incidents, but two of the greatest incidents that happened to them was uh, when during the reign of um, King um, Abdurrahman Khan, who is um, kind of a founder of Afghanistan or Afghanistan was framed uh, as its own right now border at his time. And uh, during the regime of Taliban in 2001 um, specifically. So, uh, to give in a history or informational background about the Hazara people uh, and or the geno genocidal act as we wanted to be recognized um, as such, uh, um, it happened during the 19th century and um, 20th century, early 20th century, and Hazara have, uh, um, community have faced um, persecution, discrimination under uh, Abdurrahman's um, reign, uh, who who massacred Hazara people, uh, and to give a specific date on, on that time um, was uh, in 1888, um, and about 22% of the Hazara have been killed at, um, during that time, and um, they have been uh, forced into uh, um, conversion into Sunni, um, um, sect of Islam, uh, enslaved, um, killed, um, displaced from uh, their um, original place that they were, um, and their cultural uh, identity have been removed. And from that time until today, there are uh, targeting um, persecution, hatred towards them, and that continues, although a lot of time has passed. Do two things uh, make Hazaras to stand out. First is their ethnicity. Their uh, their ethnicity is um, to be said Turko Mongolian, uh, and their uh, religion as being belong to Shia sect of Islam, and which makes them a minority in terms of um, the uh, large portion of Afghanistan be. Sunni, as Pashtuns and Tajiks and Uzbeks and the other groups um, being um, Sunni Muslim followers and Hazara being the only group who are uh, predominantly following um, Shia, the um, sect of Islam. Uh, in the late 20th centuries, the, um, the Hazara people forced, um, faced further persecution during the Afghan civil war and the Taliban regime. The Taliban were predominantly Sunni and targets Hazara for their um, Shia beliefs and ethnicity, ethnic identity. And they carried out a massacre, forced conversion, um, imposed um, discriminatory policies, such as denying Hazara to access to education and employment and any types of political rights. In recent years, Hazara has continued to face discrimination and violence um, in Afghanistan as well with the attacks carried out by the Taliban as well as um, ISIS or the Islamic State, uh, the um, Khorasan branch. And so according to United Nations, between January to September 2020, at least um, 
110 Hazaras have been killed and 345 were injured and targeted attacks. So within a month of January to September of one year, this much of um, hatred and um, persecution happens. So if you count within years, it, it is a huge number. To say that, in terms of to give you an, a very qualitative data and, um, and information about um, observation of the um, international um, human rights activists, um, I must say that the historian and human rights activist Matthew Hall said that, that the Hazara have been subjected to genocidal attacks and systematic discrimination throughout the Afghanistan history. But since the fall of the Taliban, the violence and atrocities against them have become more um, pronounced and sustained. Um, Serbia's uh, server um, uh, violence have been shared through the experience of the um, Hazaras and and um, and, uh, and international uh, communities such as Amnesty International and um, uh, human rights um, international human rights organization. They have stated that the um, uh, that the Hazaras have faced um, a historical continuation of um, hatred towards them um, since the the time of the founding uh, king of Afghanistan until now, and it is based on their religious belief as well as their ethnicity and. Um, this continues uh, to be um, as a um, mineralization of um, this community, which uh, means that it is not only to count them as a minority in Afghanistan, but also uh, limit their political rights because of that number and were said to be uh, or pushed towards to be in a limited number and um, their access to education, their access to employment, their access to uh, civil um, society rights and their political rights, their uh, access to um, held, held and um, civil um, rights have been limited to that number and always been uh, pointed out as such. Um, yeah. uh, and continuing that, um, in after the attack that happened in um, uh, educational center um, that's called Kaj, uh, and um, global activism happened, and um, all over the world, Hazaras have been active and advocate for the um, Hazara um, uh, genocide or um, or ethnic cleansing. Uh, and um, since the last time that I took a uh, look at uh, Twitter and there is a hashtag called the sub genocide and it was 53 million um, hashtags and all over the world, um, starting from uh, Australia, um, United States, uh, Europe, um, Afghanistan, um, Iran and neighboring countries. Um, and um, uh, Hazara activists are active in terms of advocating for their rights and for um, stopping violence against the Hazara. And I am a, a member of the Hazara community here, wanted to share the story and um, spread awareness. And thank you so much. Thank you, Mina. And you you certainly have a story to tell and we'll have time uh, for questions and answers, but I want to share the, the story today one more a, another Hazara woman, an Afghan woman who's been courageous in her country to fight for a better better future for Afghanistan. And uh, as a uh, lieutenant in the female tactical, Lieutenant uh, First Lieutenant Arifa, who will be speaking with you, worked with US Army and uh, Special Forces and the British in Afghanistan. Uh, they were trained by the the British, but in, they were uh, part of the Afghan army, and they went into the villages to protect the communities. And and one of my former students, Captain Katie Richardson from ASU, uh, now was at the time was deployed in Afghanistan and and worked together to, in a civic action to go into the communities and 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 hopefully bring a better life to those communities in Afghanistan. 
with uh, Arifa, and I want Arifa now to please tell your story of, uh, and because Arifa does have, she's safe, she's here, we're glad, and there's members of the female tactical platoon here in the United States, but she's got family in Ghazni, her brother's a dentist, he's not able to practice, he's in the Hazara community, she's got brothers and sisters in, in different refugee situations, she's worried about them, but we're glad you're safe, and please tell us your story, Arifa. Hello, everybody. My name is Arifa Naibi. I'm uh, from Afghanistan. And uh, uh, thank you so much, Mr. Ambassador Odanov, and also uh, the, my colleagues and audience. Thank you so much from all of you. And uh, <clears throat> uh, I want to like, shortly, uh, my English is not very, not very good, and uh, I apologize. Yeah, I try my best as much as I could like, to explain very clear. And uh, I'm uh, in 2016, I joined to the Afghan, uh, Afghan National Army uh, with, uh, I trained by British uh, Army. And uh, then in 2018, I uh, joined to the female tactical platoon with the uh, US Army. And the female tactical platoon FTPs uh, and, and are the safety of women and children during highly dangerous uh, night rides. And the, the FTP are, I, I want to say like uh, my own story about uh, the female tactical platoon. The female tactical platoon is uh, like uh, uh, Made by Rangers and uh, the uh, cultural support teams called CSTs from American soldiers. And um, it is start from 2011 uh, with uh, 12 women, 12 FTPs. And uh, then um, 2011 to 2022, lots of FTP cans and it grew to like uh, 60 FTP. And uh, now, um, uh, information from the women and children before uh, doing uh, like so they had uh, to search the, gr the group for items they could um, uh, that could uh, endanger uh, anyone. Like uh, our uh, our job was to like go to the uh, when we went to for real mission and the village. Our job was to like serve the women and children, taking care of the women and children. And if uh, they need us, we could like uh, with, uh, fight with the enemy, with uh, the target. And uh, I really enjoy my, um, uh, like I really enjoy my job, what I did and I served my, uh, for my country for, uh, almost, almost six years. And the end of my job was 20, <laughs> 2021, August 15, I, I was there. I was in Afghanistan. I was in, at, uh, in, in my base, Camp Scorpion, called Camp Scorpion. And <clears throat> and <clears throat> I was there at Camp Scorpion. Like, uh, I want to uh, talk uh, more, uh, a little bit to explain more about uh, my job. And uh, when we went to the, like the uh, for real mission and the village to find the target to an enemy, our job was to search the women and kids and find the, like uh, the, um, something dangerous. They had the, the had pistol and explosion, SIM card and uh, cell phone to the women and kids. They thought maybe they cannot find from the, they cannot say the, in Afghanistan culturally, uh, the men cannot uh, like touch to the woman. And they thought all the men came and uh, because culturally they cannot touch the woman and we can hide everything to the woman and kids. Uh, but in 2011, uh, when the uh, like American Force Rangers and uh, CSC, they decide to, 
uh, like we need uh, uh, some Afghan female, like uh, Afghan female to help us. And also to, we help the CST. The CST is uh, or, uh, like a female, they could touch to the woman, or, but to, the like culturally we know more thank uh, like than CST because uh, yeah. we were like uh, Afghan female and about the culture and what to the about more um, little bit or more information than CST we had. And they decide to like make the uh, female tactical prison in 2011. And uh, uh, we uh, fight uh, with the Taliban side by side and in about in 20 years, but I, I was late. Even I joined the army in 2016, I joined the army. And my, uh, my job was uh, like, uh, the end of my job when I, in 2021, I was in my base in August 15. I was uh, uh, in military base when the president ran away. I was there and they uh, said, you should go for like uh, two weeks off. I said, this is not right time because we already we talk about uh, the, uh, like everybody, to be ready for like um, for the mission because the situation is not good and uh, now we said like our commander said you should go for two weeks off I said this is not right time and said we will let you know after two weeks what will happen when I got to Kabul and my sister called he said and said uh, where are you I said I just get to Kabul and. Uh, and she said, as soon as you can get home and uh, uh, because president ran away, situation is not normal in here and you should come home. I said, I, I couldn't believe because I said this, I'm dreaming. And uh, she said, no, we are uh, watching the news and it's, um, it's not good. You should come home as soon as you can. And uh, when I get home and I watch the news and it was, yeah, it was right. The president ran away, but I was in the army. No one knows the president ran away. And because our leader, the commander, he didn't say anything to us. In this film. Talk about it. Evacuation, let me help you uh, there. That yeah, yeah. And then we need to wrap up yeah. so we have questions. Uh, Just go ahead, please. Okay. So we can have some questions. And the uh, evacuation system and uh, FTPs work around the um, clock for several weeks to evacuate the 42 FTPs safely to United States. They use um, messaging app, uh, apps to communicate with each other. Well, I went after, after five days, I want to say very shortly, uh, I'm sorry because we don't have time. And uh, uh, I, we were in hide for four days and we, uh, we talked with each other with the like CST and United States and the, our mentor and they helped us uh, was hide and uh, they uh, gave us ad advice how to get to the airport. And uh, when we uh, went to the airport, this crowd, I'm not in this picture and I'm sure we, we I was somewhere. But <laughs> it, was, it was so sad on that situation. And August 18, August 18, we got to the Kabul airport and uh, 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 Okay. I, I wanna... okay, let me just help uh, Rifa finish uh, this story because uh, uh, both these women are very courageous because starting with the fact that that uh, Mina would, in Afghan society, go to Bangladesh outside the country and study for four years. That was not usual in the Hazara or the Afghan community. And for Arifa to join the Afghan army 
and to help go out with Afghan and American and British soldiers to try to secure areas of Afghanistan and protect the people, that was also very unusual in her community. And so we're glad you're safe, Arifa and Mina and here, but we know it's not over. You still have memories and you still care about your families and we want you to know we care too. And I hope you'll, when you communicate friends and families, wherever they are in Afghanistan or refugee situations, let them know we care. So thank you, Arifa, thank, thank you, Mina. So now questions and answers, and we don't have a little time left for time, but please. I have a question for our two uh, Afghan scholars. I wonder if you could tell us, and I know this is hard, but a little bit about the Taliban preventing women from continued education. Um, that's a great um, and uh, speaking of emotion, um, personally, I am sad and angry. And um, every time I was speaking to this, every time I was uh, with my second wife, uh, um, and my friend, they would be main questions. And their siblings and their children cannot question. continue their education. It is really sad. It is disappointing. It, is, um, it makes us angry. Um, it makes us the price, you know, as long as it it, it takes it's almost a year, um, that um, a year and a half um, that they cannot go to school. They lost their hopes. Uh, when I'm um, speaking with them, um, they felt that like their lives have been in this. Some of them, they they say that we're, we're like a, a zombie who are um, who do not have any emotion to um, react because their dreams have been shattered. Um, they can't see their future. They cannot predict their future and say that this is my plan. This is what I want. This is, um, this is my dream uh, where uh, I want to stand uh, like five um, of my plan five year, uh, after that. Um, or they, they do not have those dreams and a person is left by hope, right? So they have lost their hope. It is very sad for them. Any, if when, whenever they are hearing about any news about um, somebody standing against the Taliban, um, they're so hopeful. But unfortunately, there is no supporter for people who are, um, wants to fight against the Taliban and no international community are helping those people as well. So it is, it is kind of determined for them that it's, it, it, they, um, they think it's like they are. They think it not gonna any not gonna anything not gonna happen. Like no changes will come because no one is daring to fight against Taliban. And of course, you, uh, ordinary people not having any um, equipment to fight against the Taliban. How can they fight against um, a group that inherit half of the supply of the? U.S. Army that remains to them. So it is hard for them as well to fight against the Taliban to stand up, um, but also they have lost their hope. Um, at the same time, there are women who are so courageous, who runs um, a private um, school for girls, as, much, as small as five people, 10 people, till, um, 12 children, as much as they can to 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 ha to have to see that little hope in their hearts that they do not lose their faith um, and in humanity, and there are women who um, protest um, against the Taliban. There are women who stood up against the Taliban and speak against them. Um, we have uh, witnessed several um, protests and rallies against the Taliban in Kabul, in Bamiyan, in Herat, and as much as they could, they fight against. Uh, but unfortunately, there is no support from outside for them. Um, and I don't want to um, like criticize the United Nations, but of course, it is a sad reality that they do not do much in support of women as well. They cannot uh, protect the women who are uh, working for them. 
how they can protect the ones who are like, and generally in rural areas of Afghanistan or are living under the rule of Taliban. Thank you. Uh, other questions or if somebody in uh, online wants to send in a question, we'll be happy to recognize it. Sir, in the back. Question for Zoss. Um, I'm intrigued by the protest posters, the video you did in support of Ukraine. I happen to be Ukrainian, and I know also that uh, there have been some rallies in New York City where uh, refugees from Myanmar have joined Ukrainians. Uh, I'm curious, had you had any contact with Ukrainians back when you uh, did that uh, that video? And also, uh, do you have any contact with Ukrainians, perhaps Ukrainian refugees or the Ukrainian government? Uh, because ultimately we have the same enemy, right? Thank you so much for the question. Uh, I have not had directly with the uh, people from the Ukraine, but what I got is that during our cohort 2029 to 2020 with McCain Institute, a friend of mine, uh, she was working for the Lithuanian government. So uh, one of the journalists uh, the, uh, from the Lithuanian uh, country, he contacted me through my uh, friend. So I sent him out all the videos and vid uh, uh, photos as well, and also another uh, Turkey journalist from our uh, McCain Institute as well. So she was telling me that I'm just so uh, overjoyed and at, at the same time, I felt so much empathy and I make sure that I will send this video all of my Ukrainian friends. So I do not, at that time, I did not have, uh, stay, I haven't got, I haven't met any uh, uh, Ukrainian, but you might be the very first person for me to go there. Definitely, I would love to contact you. Exactly, yeah. Okay, other questions? Hello, this is Sarah from Afghanistan. My question goes to Mr. Muhammad. Sure. Uh, as we know that the Assam is like the political issue, we will have like immigration and also we will have uh, in immigration camps all over the world. But also we know that the uh, immigration, uh, the world immigration system is very broken. Everyone knows. And uh, uh, the United Nations, the UN, UNHCR, they are uh, not able to assist the immigra immigrants and the asylum seekers all over, all over the world. Uh, if I uh, talk about my own country, in Afghanistan, we don't have like any camp that uh, you know, Afghan people are not safe. They need to get out of Afghanistan, but there is no camp that they should go. They have two solutions, uh, cross the border, go to Iran, and cross the border, go to Pakistan, but there is no hope for them. The only thing that they can, they can uh, 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 just register themselves, their family to UNHCR, but there is no hope that they can go, uh, get out of Pakistan or Iran. The only thing that they can, they can knock the door of every country, but there is no answer for them. If we, if we talk like uh, about other countries, like uh, most of uh, African countries, they uh, spend their all life in camp. They born in camp, they grew up in camp, they became adult in camp, and uh, maybe like 10% of them, they have the chance to get out of the camp and come to US, go to Canada or Europe. But how can we solve this problem? Because I, I'm asking you because you are an international lawyer. So we should find a way because it's not our problem that we are immigrants. As you said that we are born in Middle East, it's not our problem, but it's the world problem. As long as uh, we are a part of the world, the world needs to find a solution and find a way that we should have a better life. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Yesterday, yesterday night, I was at the same topics with, with, with my colleagues here because uh, it's, it's, it's a global issue. It's, uh, I think it's, it's a trend now. Everybody talk about it, especially after the people uh, express what happened with Ukraine. And if all the refugees all around the world felt that how come the system works with the Ukrainian and not works with anyone else. Since that moment, they start talking about these topics. We know 
the, uh, the, um, the system how it's filled with UNHCR. I would totally understand where you are come from. And uh, yesterday, really, we spent uh, almost uh, the half of, of the dinner talking about the system, the process, whether the difference between refugees and asylum seekers, how is UNHCR interact with, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the different countries. Uh, I wish I have an answer to you. I, if you can find an answer, let me know. I can really advocate for that. But this is, this is how the system built with UNHCR. Yeah. And just keep in mind what I said yesterday, that even UNHCR itself funded by government, by US government, Canada government. So any money, any money comes for this UN agency still comes with agenda. So then everybody want to take care about uh, protect uh, what they already have in their countries. So uh, I'm sure there's like a solution will happen, but it will not be in the near future. Uh, we need to advocate for that. I think uh, being discussed these topics with, within this event with, and, and other events that will open a window for, for, uh, for us as a human rights activist to go for UNHCR and push uh, the process and try to mobilize it in a way that will be the same as with the Ukrainian, because Ukrainian with three days. And I know people in Jordan spend 81 years in the camps. So uh, we don't want to be spending three days, at least three years, you know? So yeah, uh, hopefully I can answer your question. Thank you. We need to continue to work on this. Yes. And that's a great message, spread the word. One last question to close. Anyone have a question here? Yes. My question for Mohammed. I was sure. wondering what's the status of the program um, for schooling and the factory program that you were working on? So uh, for for uh, let's start with with the factory. It, it's an entrepreneurship program. So we believe that uh, we don't want to we don't want to give him fish. We want to teach him how they fish it, right? So this is how how it works. So we build. We try to work enabling women because uh, the problem is if you enable a man in the Middle East, he will marry another woman, and they just like. The circle goes up and up, and probably will be escalated. So we believe that the development comes through the next generation, the young and the women. So we provide this work. We have different uh, projects, uh, starting from traditional things and selling the holy water, up to, up to create small factories for clothes and we build it. So it's it's up and running, and uh, and all all these uh, entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs that get uh, get paid they give back to the community through these projects. In terms of the education programs, uh, it's separate. Like we have um, uh, remedial programs that's like, you know, because in Jordan, uh, the school open for two shifts. First, the morning shift for, for Jordanian uh, and the second shift for Syrian. So during the morning, we open the centers uh, because the most of the women inside the camps, they are not educated, so they cannot um, help their kids uh, during you know, for for their um, homeworks and this stuff. So this is what we do. And on the other hand, we try to support uh, the system through training the teacher how they can dealing with these kids because this is, these kids come with a lot of drama, trauma and problems. And uh, so we try to solve that. And still up and running, uh, we do. We have the four centers: uh, one in south, one in, uh, in the north, and two in the center. It's it's not a center as as, as you can feel. A center. It's it's in our uh, it's in our budget, so it's a small one. But that's something uh, better than nothing. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed, Saab, Arifa, for all you've done, and really uh, appreciate your sharing your stories with us and. We wish you luck in the future. We know we're going to hear great things from you as heritage driven leaders and leaders in your community. So, a round of applause for our